Okay. All right, so uh, this is a long day and we're going to start uh, with our lightning talks. So just to remind everybody the rules, everyone's got five minutes with 10 seconds to go. Kat or myself will put one hand up, at which point everyone does a finger clap. Have a go. And then after 10 seconds, we'll put both our hands up. And that will be the polite invitation to uh, the speaker to tell them they are finished. Um, any questions? Okay, I think we're ready. So our very first speaker is uh, Nassar al Shawa talking about remember, it's just a tool. Let's welcome Nassar. So uh, good evening, everybody. I'm hoping to get you riled up a little bit by this talk. So here we go. Uh, my name is Nasser al Shawa, and my talk is Remember, It's Just a Tool. So we all know this. You know, design patterns, uh, the problem with design patterns is that although they're useful tools, they can be easily misused as a panacea. Does my code have enough design patterns? Does it have enough? That's not the point. We just know as Python programmers, we're better than that. But my concern is that we treat another thing the same way, the Zen of Python. And so I'm here asking questions. We might, be, we might be misusing it in a similar way. We're misusing design patterns. Is simple really always better than complex? What if we can achieve, let's say, better algorithmic complexity with slightly more complex code? Is, there all, is the one and only one way to solve a problem always obvious? I have a quote here from Andre Alexandrescu. I'm a C++ programmer, by the way. Okay. Which, uh, which basically says that software engineering has this multiplicity that there's a lot of nuances between right and wrong and the better, and he then goes on to say that designing software is hard because it forces you to choose and that the good engineers know which solutions scale differently in which direction and so it might not be that obvious the proper way to uh, solve a programming problem. So. Uh, the Zen of Python isn't a set of laws, but rather a set of guidelines, in my opinion. And we shouldn't stick to it if it doesn't help us achieve the, our goals. So we had a great performance talk a couple of days ago, which started with presenting a bad example of how to find an element in a list, and then a slightly better example of not using indices to iterate, and then using the in keyword to do a linear search in the list. So now that we've achieved this, which is purportedly twice as fast as the example from two slides ago, are we Pythonic? Well, this is simple. It is faster than before. But the, the real question should be, what are the constraints that our data gives us? What if we can, for example, sort this list and implement the slightly more complex binary search algorithm, which uh, achieves us, uh, gives us a better algorithmic complexity? Is simple always better than complex? Well, maybe, or slightly more complex? Another example, quick example, uh, uh, is from gaming. So you might be familiar with the Arkanoid game, and this, is, this comment is more targeted towards the object-oriented paradigm, for example. So when we model those bricks in object-oriented programming, we try to use the code, our classes, to model real-world objects. But again, is this the best way to, uh, is this, uh, this tool that we have, OOP and modeling real world objects, the best approach to the solutions? Uh, what game designers like to do or game developers like to do, for example, is uh, try to sort data into components. And if you know anything about renderers, you know that they like to take data in batches. And so our class, Bricks, might not represent individual real world objects, but it represents you know, something that uh, translates better, for example, for our renderer API. So, uh, you know, these are a bit convoluted examples, but it's a five minute talk. This is just the point I'm trying to make. Um, so, uh, what, really, what I really want to tell you is uh, first, give you a piece of advice, is that things like design patterns, the Zen of Python, and OOP give us a useful set of guidelines and tools but they're not substitutes for us. Uh, they're not substitutes uh, for us to think for ourselves. And I'm also gonna leave you with a wish. 
May we catch all of the exceptions life throws at us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So not only did we get some real good, real world advice there, but we managed to get it all finished in under five minutes. Impressive. Um, I'm going to get David to come up and set up. Um, our next talk is going to be how we develop hypothesis with David McIver. Um, McIver. While he's setting up, McIver, sorry. I'm Cornish, I can't do spellings and pronunciation. Um, while I've got you all here as a captive audience, I'm going to remind you that tonight there is a board game session. Um, the excitement. Please make sure you update your profile if you're going. Um, it's downstairs in the main hall from about seven-ish. If you've got board games, bring them. If you don't have them, someone will have brought some, so you can join in. Um, and there'll be pizza, I believe. So... Did anyone bring pythons and ladders? Oh, dear. Uh, no, I think you use the same table. It'll be here all weekend, everyone. Try it again, try it again. Um, so, yeah, hopefully some of you will be heading along to that. Uh, remember, it is the boxing tonight, so don't expect any restaurants to have any room because the, the actual fight doesn't start till about 11-ish. So people will be out, I'm sure. There we go. Oh, we're ready to go. How exciting. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to David. I'm not going to try and pronounce his name because I'll get it wrong again. <laughs> no worries. Enjoy. Okay. Hi everyone, don't worry, I'm not here to tell you lots more fascinating facts about trees. Uh, so uh, I work on and created a library called Hypothesis, which uh, Alice very ably told us about yesterday, so I'm not going to tell you too much about the library itself, but what I want to tell you instead is that it's, we've done a lot to sort of, as a, both me individually and us as a team, to shape the development process a lot, and it has ended up being one of the more pleasant experiences I've had to develop software, um, despite the occasional screaming moment. Um, and uh, as uh, Alex Chan, who you may have seen around, put it the other day, it sort of ruined me for every other project. So I, can, I wanna share just like what I think are the, base, the three best things we do about it, and hopefully you can steal some of these ideas for your own projects. Uh, the first is trust the computer. The, Hypothesis CI is slightly unreasonable. Um, we're currently, uh, so you think this is a lot, but I couldn't fit all of the jobs on the screen. And this is Travis, and we're also running AppVeyor and Circle CI. Um, I think every hypothesis build ends up using about two hours of CPU time, but it's well enough parallelized so that it takes about 10, 15 minutes to, it's, if America isn't awake yet. Um, and, the result is that we actually have a build where, generally speaking, if the build passes, then you, should, you can be running this because it not only tests the build, it tests that the build is testing, the, no, it tests the tests, it has a whole bunch of checks and integrity checks. That means that like, when the build passes, you really have high confidence that it works. And most CI, we end, uh, continuous integration, we end up running, and what I've run in the past, you haven't had this level of confidence, so there's always this sort of, will it work, won't it work, when you ship it? And if you've not experienced this level of confidence in your build, I do invite you to think, like, how can you improve it? How can you do a bit more testing, possibly using Hypothesis? Uh, and uh, Hypothesis is tested with Hypothesis, by the way. Um, so improving the quality of your build really just is the gift that keeps on giving. The second thing is that we have somehow, I suspect as much luck as judgment, but once we have had it, we created, tried to keep a good thing. We've got a very collaborative code review process. No one is trying to catch every, anyone out. It, we have a style guide for how to do code review, and it explicitly says the purpose of code review is to create better software together for us and the users and uh, details a lot of things. And we've got this very nice back and forth, and we've managed to create a culture where everyone is on the same side and everyone is trying to produce better work together. And code review frequently turns toxic. And I've, so far, we've only had like one slightly dicey moment in the entire history of code review and hypothesis, and that got resolved amicably. And 
so looking at your code review culture, making it explicit, we do have a code of conduct, by the way, uh, as well as a review guide, and all of these play very well into a culture that where code review is now fun, and that's been a big deal. Um, oh yes, I had an example of this, but this doesn't matter very much. Uh, and the final thing that we do, which has just been life-changingly good, is we do continuous deployment of the library. Like when a, when a pull request is merged, um, it comes with a description that says the release type and has an entry for the change log, and then the build runs, and then about half an hour later tops, there's something up on PyPI. And we are doing sort of depending on uh, how busy we are with other things, about 15 releases a month at the moment. And this is actually great because it means no one's waiting around, there's no one going, uh, can you do a release? There's no manual management. And it means that we, um, like even a new user gets the fun of saying, hey, I did this, this is my hypothesis release. And that's been really nice for people and for bringing new people on board. Uh, which is the final thing I want to mention, which is that because we've got created such this great experience for developing hypothesis, it would be great if some of you could get on board. We can ruin you for other projects too. Uh, and maybe you can pick up some of these ideas and take them to your other thing. I know that all of us end up cobbling together uh, new projects we start based on bits of the hypothesis build. So come check out hypothesis, uh, give it a try on your own projects and Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, David. show the presenter notes, um, but the presenter notes will be there, you no, see. No, I want the presenter notes Yeah, but when you press play, it sh let's quickly try it and see if it puts it in the right place. I don't want the presenter notes on screen. Uh, continue, let's see if it puts it in the right place. If it doesn't, we'll no. do, oh, that's something iTunes, different. that's something completely different. Let's go back to, uh, oh, for we this. <laughs> so, um, so let's, where, where, where's your dog? Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, so let's do this. Okay, keynote. Let's, let's keynote. Okay, we're in keynote now. If we press that. Oh, fuck. No, don't press play. Okay, uh, <laughs> if I do it again, it might have a different result. There you are. And Thank there you. Are. Yes. <laughs> Get there in the end. I have no Thank you for welcoming Georgina. Hi, my name is Georgina, or, oh, you're that knitting lady, as I've become known at this year's PyCon. I started meditating regularly as a New Year's resolution in 2014, after a really difficult Christmas season when my anxiety spiked through the roof. I found this great app called Headspace and committed to using it daily for a minimum of 10 minutes. I can't remember exactly when it was that I realized it was making a difference, but I think it was about a few weeks in. Curious and addicted to feeling a little bit more like a functional human being, I started to slowly increase my meditation time and have since been on several intensive meditation retreats, including a completely silent one earlier this year. So what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is paying attention. That can be to your breath, body sensations, or the sounds around you. 
anything that's happening right now. It's also about being kind to yourself, noticing any judgmental narrative you have about what's happening or how your meditation is going and letting that go. For me, this part in particular has been a real challenge. There are quite a few misconceptions about what mindfulness and meditation are. Dan Harris from the 10% Happier podcast has a saying, clearing your mind is impossible unless you're enlightened, in which case congratulations, or dead. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you will fail at paying attention over and over and over again. That's the whole point. You get lost. Notice you're lost and start again. It's like working a muscle at the gym, only in this case, you're strengthening your attention muscle. There's no need to sit in cross-legged position, and you, while you can use a chant as a focus point, it's certainly not compulsory. Comfortable but alert is the aim, whether that's by sitting in a chair, standing, walking, or even lying down. It is possible to reach deep, highly concentrated states, which can be extremely pleasant, I've experienced it a handful of times, mostly on retreat after intense practice. But it's not the goal, and could often serve as a distraction. Ironically, the most uncomfortable meditations I've had have been the most worthwhile, because they've given me insight about my own mental processes. It's the effect on your life off the cushion that counts. Our minds have already been programmed by our genetics, upbringing, the culture around us, and our experiences, but sometimes this programming is less than optimal. But we do know that the brain can form new neural pathways through a process called neuroplasticity. This means we can reprogram our brain in beneficial ways, debug the operating system, if you like. Meditation is a great tool for this. By practicing, we get quicker at coming back. This improves our focus and concentration. We can identify damaging thought patterns and realize we don't have to believe everything we think. We can create a slightly bigger gap between an event and our emotional response. We can learn to get out of our own way. A happier, more relaxed mind can be a more creative mind. Would you like to give it a go? You don't have to, it's just for a minute. Adjust your position, if you like, to one that's comfortable but alert. If you feel comfortable doing so, you can gently close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths. Relax your stomach, your shoulders, your jaw. What's it like to be breathing right now? Feel breath coming in, feel your breath going out. If you get distracted, that's fine, just come back to your breath. Okay, we're done, that's one minute, you've meditated. You can open your eyes. <sighs> If you're interested in exploring further, there's a course and app for that. Um, I hope you give it a try and find it useful. You can come and chat to me later if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hopefully you're all a little bit more relaxed now. Um, before we move on to our fourth talk, I'm actually going to introduce you to someone very special who's coming to speak to us. So, yeah, you're special. <laughs> so, I'm going to hand over to Johnny for a sec. Hello everyone. So, I think a lot of you know there's quite a long tradition of the Python community at PyCon UK doing cool and exciting things with microbits. And a lot of what was shipped to the UK children for microbit and Python was developed by people at PyCon UK or by this community. And we want to continue that tradition. So, it's not only children here that we are going to be able to give microbits to. We don't have microbits for everybody because this is a really big conference. But what we have is we have between 30 and 50 microbits to give out today to people that want to play with them either during the board game session, in the hotel room tonight, in the morning, but not in other people's conference sessions. That would be unfair. Um, 
and then come to the micro bit show and tell session that we've got in the afternoon tomorrow. So if you are keen to try something, you want to contribute to the Microbit project, come and see someone from Microbit. We'll be standing with things that look like sweet bags, but actually they've got Microbits in them uh, at the end of the lightning talks. And please only take one if you think you're going to do something with it. Uh, if you're not going to do something with it, leave it for someone who will do something awesome. Thanks. I'm going to hand over to Danny. Uh, hello, world. Um, I always wanted to say that in a conference. Hi, my name is Danny and I'm a geotechnical engineer. Do you know, how many of you know what a geotechnical engineer does? Oh, that's great. Five more hands that I wanted. Brilliant. So, in a nutshell, I design anything that has to do with soil structure interaction, like foundations, piles, embankments, retaining walls, my favorite. So today, oops, after I, you know, um, I'm going to explain to you how we use Python as a tool and optimization techniques like the O tools and um, um, NumPy and SciPy to, to optimize and make safer the process of designing a retaining wall in these systems. So this is a piling retaining wall I'm going to use as an example for uh, this presentation. This is a, king, uh, a contiguous sheet pile retaining wall. Basically, it's still embedded in the ground. It keeps things in place. The important thing is that it stays in place. People are safe. You can drive on top of the, the embankment. It's fine. You can drive to your work, to the hospital, wherever you want. And we want this to happen for about 100 years. So we have a design life. So. There are rules to play by. This is the British standards. We have to design according to these standards. We can't deviate. It's the law. If you deviate from that and you, you are getting sent to the court, you must have a very strong argument to say, well, I didn't follow this because I'm smarter and I've done better things. But if you're in the court, you must have done something wrong. Product information. The, the supplier provides us with the technical properties of the piles that we want to use. These are the Z piles. Moment of inertia is a critical parameter. It basically shows how stiff the pile is in a nutshell. And we have a lot of those spreadsheets. So how we design, we have the soil inputs. These parameters come from the geotechnical site investigation. Basically, you drill a hole in the ground, you get a sample, you test it, you derive the parameters, voila. Other input is the surcharge. In a nutshell, how many cars are, are driving on top of the embankment? And now you're wondering, I'm in a Python conference and there is an engineer talking roads to me. I'll get to the points. Wall properties, output, moment of inertia, and length, how long the retaining wall will be. These parameters define the amount of steel that you're buying. So you want it to be safe, but also you want it to be cheap because you want to build many roads or you want to stabilize the back of your garden or whatever. You're a private landowner. What we do is we take the geotechnical parameters, we assume a length, we assume a cross-section, and we design, is the factor of safety greater than one? Great. How greater than one it is? Then you start decreasing. You select another input, and so on and so forth. So this is quite a strenuous process because you solve the same problem with different input. So an approach I have came with is that we need to think of the problem as an optimization problem. We have to minimize the factor of safety and then minimize the displacement. That's how far the pile moves because it will move. Subject to moment of inertia and embedment length. The, the bottom, the first boundary, the six meters, is defined by the height, the retained height. It's a minimum requirement. The largest can be defined by a variety of parameters which are subject to another talk, but this way, we do iterations based on the factor of safety and the displacement on the boundaries that we specify in our code rather than selecting an input and running it over and over again. This not only saves us time as designers, but it makes also things safer in shorter time and we don't miss deadlines, important bit in engineering. And these are the tools that we use. It's the SciPy and the OR tools. So the reason that I'm here today is to basically let you know that, hey, Python has more applications than you can think. It's not, it's a tool for us, you know, as Nasser said earlier, and it applies to more constraint satisfaction problems that you can think. Thank you very much.
during this changeover, we're just going to have a quick announcement about a particular detail in the board game night. Um, so just to let everyone know, alongside the board game evening, we're going to be running a Python B. Um, so if you don't know what that is, uh, this was created in 2008 by a group of MIT students who entered a competition for bad ideas, and I've been running it every year since because it's quite fun. Uh, it's just a spelling bee for programmers where you try and write a program without being able to look at it. You've got to spell it out one character at a time, including all the punctuation, all the white space, new lines, everything. Uh, it's great fun. And also a twist on that, which is a co-op mode, where you've got to write a program as a group, so you're not allowed to look at the code, but you have to write one character each going around the group, and you're not allowed to communicate with each other at all. It's great fun. Please come and have a go. Okay, and following that, let's give Josh a big round of applause. So just as you thought, the kids' lightning talks were over, they're not. So, hello, my name is Josh, and I'm creator of Edublocks and 13-year-old Python developer. I'm a PyTop Future Champion and BT Young Pioneer Finalist 2017 and National Coding Week Rising Star. So what is Edublocks? Edublocks is a drag-and-drop version of Python 3, which is similar to Scratch. It allows you to drag-and-drop blocks of Python code to build up a program. Edublocks is a way to learn the Python 3 syntax. It allows an easy way for younger children to learn how Python works without minimal errors. Edublocks is also an educational tool for children to make the transition from Scratch to Python. And at the same time, it's a platform for educators too. So why did I create Edublox? In 2015, I started to learn Python and found that it's quite difficult to do. So I started off with Scratch and then went straight to Python. But I found that there's no solution to bridge the gap. This is where Edublox comes in. Edublox is the drop-in solution which allows you to drag and drop blocks of Python code to make the transition easier. So how does it help people? As we can see on the left, is an example of an Edublox program. That is a simple import time while true and then printing hello world and then sleeping for one second. At the bottom, you can download the .py file to run it in idle and then see it in a Python view by clicking a button. So what are the libraries and features? It includes a basic Python menu GPIO 0, which allows you to create GPIO projects with your Raspberry Pi. Minecraft, which is an API to connect to Minecraft and allows you to create programs in Python. Explorer Hat, which is a simple motor controller. Blinked, which is a NeoPixel strip. HTTP Client, which allows you to access websites. Sensat, there's two of these currently on the International Space Station and Sonic Pi, which allows you to create music with code. Here is a quick example of what Edublox is. So here we can see getting blocks from the toolbar, dragging them into the workspace. This will build the example that you saw on the earlier slide. So next we'll find a wild true state. Oh no, we've got that. A print statement, which will then allow us to input text and then print it out into the shell. So here we can see it typing, hello, PyCon UK. And then we run it in the shell. The next example is GPIO 0. So in the bottom right hand corner, you can see an LED and a breadboard. So that's hooked up to a Raspberry Pi, which is off the camera. And here we'll create a pulsing LED. So you can see how simple it is to create a Python program. Here we're going to switch to the Python view so you can see the Python code. And then run it in the shell. And on the bottom right hand corner, you can see the pulsing LED. The next example is Minecraft. So this will connect to the Minecraft server, which is in the bottom right-hand corner, and then post a chat, which will post a message into the chat. 
This one will say hello world. We'll switch to the Python view again. Now you don't have to do this every time, but it's good if you're teaching someone how to code in Python and you can see that it runs in Minecraft. A big part to Edublox is the Python community and it's all hosted up on GitHub. So if you take a picture, if you want, um, of that link there, you can see how you can contribute on GitHub. We accept pull requests, fork of our repository, and also issues if you've got any additions or problems with Edublox. So what's next? So we're looking at creating a desktop version, which will allow you to run Edublox on the Mac, PC, and Linux. At the minute, it's just Raspberry Pi. Also, we'd like to create a Debian package so that it is um, in Raspbian as a standard and a Mike Python editor as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. And just a reminder for you all, Josh is 13. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to say that tomorrow Josh will be receiving one of the John Pinner Awards for Service to the Community, so please pop along to see him receive that. Um, HDMI? Sorry. Josh, I've known Josh for the last few months and he's an absolutely incredible person to know because he's so enthusiastic about helping people learn to code, so please get involved with Edublox if you can. I've mentioned Edublox about five times today at least and I'm going to keep saying it because it's great and he's great. Um, so next up, we've got Stuart Robinson, who's going to talk about You Cannot Add Simple, Building the World's Smallest Satellite. Good evening. Uh, November 2013, early one morning. I was watching this online. Uh, on this rocket uh, from Dombrovsky in Russia, that's a, a ballistic missile, uh, was the first four of a new class of satellite. Uh, this new class of satellite were called pocket cubes. Uh, the pioneer of the pocket cube concept was Professor Robert Twiggs, which some of you may know also pioneered the CubeSat format that's now become so ubiquitous. Pocket cubes were to be based on a 50 mil cube size, which is Two inches, that small. Smaller satellites meaning lower launch costs. The satellites would be simple to build, must use off-the-shelf commercial components, the sort of stuff you could buy in Maplin, and the construction should be within the remit of schools and colleges. This was an educational project. Uh, the particular problem we faced was communications. We were trying to use a module that you can buy on eBay for about $2. Um, the manufacturer reckoned it was good for about a kilometre. We needed at least 700, because that was the altitude of the satellite. A lot of the testing was based on some very simple concepts and done in the valleys, of South, valleys and hills of South Wales. There's a 40 kilometre line of sight from north of Cardiff to uh, the Mendip Hills. And the basic idea was we were measuring how much power we needed to go 40 kilometres. We could then work out how much power we would need to communicate with our satellite in space. We were requiring two-way communications. It wasn't just something that was beeping in space. Right, uh, around 2012, there, there is a well-known saying amongst uh, people in the Amateur Satellite Fraternity that there's no such thing as a free launch. But in this, <laughs> in this particular case, there was, and Professor Twigg said, would we like to build a satellite? Which, of course, we said yes. Uh, the team was my uh, two, two colleagues from America uh, and myself, all sort of involved in electronics. Um, I, I, I quote myself as an electronics tinkerer, but I was involved in manufacturing of commercial products in the 80s, things like the micro and stuff like that. Uh, we decided to call our satellite 50Sat, and the philosophy we adopted was you cannot add simple. This had to be simple, and, and you just can't add that stuff. We needed to do the minimum to prove that the idea would work, because this had never been tried before. The boards were to be 40 mil in size. That's the size we're working with. We were going to use a PICAX40X2. That is a PIC micro that runs an interpreted form of BASIC. And the radio was an RFM22B. 
We needed all sorts of protection against particles in space, which is the watchdog and latch-up protection. We all had to build it in. Uh, construction of the electronics took place in the 50 stack clean room facility, uh, better known as my shed. Um, that is actually the first development module to prove that all the code worked, um, and, and it's sunning itself on the table. Uh, the, the satellite itself was very simple in construction. It was basically four aluminium plates, and these were in fact built in a, in a, in a school metal work room. Um, the two boards we used, uh, on the left is the maximum power point controller for the solar panels, uh, and on the right is the processor, and, uh, the processor and radio board, the small battery in the background. Uh, that's it assembled. Uh, there's a lot of space inside. <laughs> Uh, but you can see a hand in the background. Uh, that's what it finally ended up looking like, uh, and that is the true size. And if you're around tomorrow, I'll be walking around with sat in the box, um, which is my a full-size working model. And yes, we did use tape rule for the antenna. There's a, there's a very specific reason for that, but we did. Uh, that's a full working model. Uh, now, you're going to ask why, 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 am, I to, why am I here? What, what's this got to do with Python? Um, well, the code for this was written in uh, an interpreted basic, which is very simple to understand. And, uh, and I selected a bit there. And, and I hope I got a go-to in as well. I like go-tos. Um, <laughs> And the code was dead easy to understand. Now, since this satellite, I've been playing with, you know, that, that other platform, the one that you go to hell if you use strings. So I decided to fill in Python. Finally, thanks. Those are all the people involved. <laughs> and like I said, if you want to have a closer look, you're more than welcome. I'll be wandering around with it tomorrow. Thank you very much. Okay, as our, our next two speakers get set up, there's a few people that weren't here earlier on, but just to remind everybody, you were having an extra hour's sleep t tonight, right? The clock's changed. So, uh, Daniele specifically wanted me to say to remind everyone that we have to thank him for that. So, thank you, Daniele, for the extra hour's sleep. Okay, so everybody, welcome Prashant and Marco. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Prashant and uh, this is Marco. I'm, uh, this is a community announcement. We are here to talk about PyData London 2018. Um, uh, this is a PyData London is a worldwide, uh, PyData is a worldwide uh, community. We, these are the these are the various places where we have uh, meetups running and conferences running. Um, so, uh, PyData London in particular is uh, is is the biggest biggest uh, meetup in on the world, I guess. Uh, Six thousand plus members, uh, and um, so we have monthly meetups. Uh, we also arrange uh, annual conferences. Um, the next conference is going to happen some, uh, so this is the fifth, fifth edition, it's going to happen sometime in June. We are still working on the dates. Uh, Marco here is uh, one of the chairs of the conference. I am one of the co-organizers. Uh, uh, at this point, I would like to point out that uh, NumFocus, um, this is a non-profit which, which promotes, uh, which builds, which uh, innovation for scientific computing, and it is there are a lot of projects which NumFocus uh, uses, which you would have been using, um, and so all the proceeds for generated from this conference go to NumFocus so that they can build awesome tools like these. Now, out of these, uh, some of which you um, might know, like Pandas, Jupyter others like SimPy, and um, I would urge you to uh, go and have a look at the NumPy website and uh, check out these awesome tools that they are building. 
Um, so, so I'm here to talk about uh, speaking at um, uh, at the PyCon, and Marco would like to tell about the uh, mentorship program. Yeah, so a lot of people in our community are always uh, happy to help, and uh, in particular, we are trying to promote this idea of mentorship. So, experienced speakers. Uh, can help you if you've never given a talk at a conference before. We want to see new people coming on stage, like Brush, and uh, simply they can tell you what you expect, uh, how to get the best out of it. So we are trying to promote uh, this idea of having new uh, speaker on stage. And uh, finally, if you're not going uh, to any of the interesting social events, uh, we have an unofficial PyData beer happening just down the road. So you know, come and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to drag Martin O'Hanlon on stage to set up. He hadn't realised then, he was just in his own little world. Um, well, he, while Martin's setting it up, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and promote my own talk tomorrow. Um, <laughs> How could I not? Uh, so tomorrow in the Ferrier Hall, I'm going to be doing a talk about mental health in the coding community. So I hope some of you can come along. It's at 11.30. Remember the clocks have changed. <laughs> um, so it would be really nice if some of you could come. Uh, and for now, I'm going to let Martin O'Hanlon, who co-wrote Adventures in Minecraft, which is a really cool book, um, to talk about creating a super simple Bluetooth remote for physical computing. Plug. Second edition coming soon. Um, hi, um, my name's Martin, as we kind of so pleasantly introduced. Uh, one of the things I do is uh, I support the Ras Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, with our Pi Academy course. Uh, and in kind of in line with, our, with the mission around you know, di uh, digital making, we do a lot of this. We make a lot of things. Yeah? Things that spin around, things that light up, uh, taking bears, sticking screwdrivers in them, cameras in their eyes, and all sorts of horrible things to them. Um, However, inevitably, this happens. Oh, wires are such a pain. Uh, I cannot stress enough how, how horrible it is to have a keyboard sticking out, out the side of something when you just want to set it free. Yeah? Um, and delivering wireless solutions has always been an absolute nightmare. Yeah? Um, Wi-Fi is always so difficult particularly when in a public place and they don't let, let you communicate peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah? And wireless comms APIs are so complicated for somebody who's, you know, is uh, only really just getting to grips with writing five-line Python code. Yeah? So I kind of challenged myself, you know, uh, I'm sure we can do better. Yeah? So I challenged myself to create a kind of super simple wireless button. Yeah? Um, and this is what I ended up with. That's a big blue dot. Yeah. Um, so what the, so what blue dot is, and that's kind of what I want to talk about, is uh, it is a big blue dot. Yeah. Uh, it is a uh, Bluetooth app uh, for an Android phone, and there's a Python one as well. You can run on your computer or your Pi. Um, uh, and when you press it, there is a Python library uh, that you can run code on your on your ra Raspberry Pi and make things happen. Yeah. Um, but kind of the great thing about a big blue dot is it's not just a button. You know. Uh, if I press it at the top, or the bottom, or the left, or the right, or the middle, I can kind of make a deep end out, out of it, yeah? Yeah? If I swipe it from left to right, or up and down, I can, you know, do that kind of move between pages, yeah? If I take it from one side to the other, I can cre create a slider. If I turn it around in a circle, I can cre create a click wheel. So one big blue dot can do a lot of things. Um, so... I kind of released this to a few people that I thought, you know, I, I, people I trust, people that wouldn't make, it, make a, a fool of me and say, oh, your project's rubbish. Yeah. Um, we refined it a bit, and then I released it to the wild. And um, there was a Pi Academy, uh, I think it was kind of back in the summer, I wasn't there, um, but I saw this picture. Perhaps you can't see it. Oh! <laughs> that makes your day. Yeah. When the problem that you foresaw, somebody used it to fix this, fix their problem. That gives you a good day, yeah? Excellent. So in terms of how you use it, I wanted to make it kind of super simple. So uh, that is a four-line uh, Python program to create 
a wireless remote. Uh, you, know, you import it, you create it, you wait for it to be pressed, and you stick out a message. Yeah. And there's a lot of alignment between you know, kind of blue dot and that kind of physical computing. Yeah. So it's really kind of important that it work well uh, with GPIO zero, yeah. our kind of library for interacting with components. So you can do things, things, things like this. Yeah. So I create the blue dot, I create an LED. Yeah. When it's pressed, I turn it on. When it's released, I turn it off. Yeah. Super simple. So, I just want to leave you, if you ever find yourself in need of a, of a solution for taking the wires away from your physical computing project, have a look at Blue Dot. Thank you.